My name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is January 31st, 2024, and I call this meeting to order. Um, I just wanted to start, I needed to mention an issue that's been raised by our compliance and licensing teams. Um, they've been fielding an inordinate number of calls, text messages, and emails with the sole question of where is my application or renewal in the pipeline. Um, I'm empathetic to the anxiety that applicants experience and the economic position that um, you all are in. Um, but every time we are responding to an email or phone call, it's uh, taking a staff person away from the work of actually reviewing the applications. And it really does slow things down for everyone. Um, I can certainly appreciate the need for state government to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time, um, which means that we certainly need to be able to communicate to applicants when they're in the pipeline. But there is a difference between emails um, with questions that are necessary for approval, um, like genuine questions about the application itself versus um, status emails. Um, we're happy to answer the former, but when it comes to the latter, we've set up and published communication processes that are meant to avoid you having to call with that question, when will my application be approved? So let me review the process quickly now. Um, so within a day of an application being submitted, um, we will change the status in the portal to received. And then within three business days of your application, um, your application status will change to in review, and you should um, see an invitation from CSI to initiate your background check. Um, depending on your priority status, this initial review period may last up to 30 days, calendar days, um, from the original date of submission. So sometime within that 30-day calendar window, you should expect to receive an email from our licensing team through the portal that lays out any areas where your application is incomplete. And it will also include instructions on how to correct those areas of incompleteness. Once we've sent this notice, um, we will not pick your application back up until you have updated all the areas of insufficiency and then resubmitted the application. So um, this is an area where an applicant can really accelerate or delay the approval process, depending on how quickly they move. Once an application has been resubmitted, you'll see a change in the status in the portal to resubmitted, and we will begin to review the changes. It sounds like it's this stage where we're getting a lot of these status phone calls and emails. So let me just say what is published in our application guidance document. Um, reviewing a resubmittal takes us about 14 calendar days. You know, your, your application is not the only one in the queue and the team here isn't sitting around waiting for it to be resubmitted. We've moved on to other applications in the meantime. And so we give ourselves a little bit of a grace period in order to finish whatever applications we picked up in the interim and then come back to a resubmittal. Um, if everything looks good and you've have all the other licensing prerequisites satisfied prior to our published cutoff date for that month, um, we will change your status once again to pending CCP review and add you to our agenda for the board meeting to approve at the next regular meeting. Um, these agendas are, of course, published at least 48 hours in advance um, of the meeting, so you have some time to follow up with the staff here at that point if you think that you should have been on the list, but you're not. Um, I know this is new for everyone um, and that applicants are investing a lot of money into this endeavor, um, but that really doesn't justify the 20, 30, or in a very case, 52 phone calls and emails that one applicant gave us merely checking on the status of their application. Um, this slows things down for everyone and it's really bordering on harassment. Um, these timelines and statuses are clearly laid out in a guidance on the guidance page of our website. That's ccb.vermont/guidance under um, the link application status flowchart. So, if we're outside those timeframes, or you have a legitimate question about the substance of the application, 
go ahead and reach out to us. But if we're in these time frames, again, it's 30 days uh, from the original submission and then 14 days from resubmission, please show some restraint and let the process play out. Um, and this is not meant as a you know criticism of any of my colleagues around the country, but our licensing team processes applications in a lot less time, about a third of the time as most adult use states. And our new pre-qualification process will hopefully reduce that time frame even further. Um, so thank you to the licensing team, thank you to the compliance team, and um, we're all in this together. So other than that, um, just need to approve the minutes from our regular meeting um, from December 20th, 2023, and also our special meeting from January 5th, 2024. You guys had a chance to look at those? Yes. Yes. All right. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, Bryn, I'm going to turn things over to you. So here is your executive director report for um, today's meeting. We're going to start out with uh, a little bit of a reminder for everybody about what the very exciting thing that's coming in 2024, um, which is our new license type that was approved by the legislature uh, during last year's session, which is the propagation cultivation license type. I just wanted to give a very brief update on because um, I know there are folks out there that are looking forward to be, being able to apply for this license type. So this slide just has a, um, actually is a, it pulls directly from the statute to list what this license, uh, this type of licensee will be authorized to do under the statute. Um, and that's to cultivate up to 3,500 square feet of immature cannabis plants. Um, test, transport, and sell those cannabis clones and immature plants to other licensees, licensed cultivators specifically, and to tra test, transport, and sell cannabis seeds um, that meet the federal definition of hemp to licensed cultivators, retailers, or to the public. Um, and what these licensees will not be able to do is to cultivate mature cannabis plants. Um, for the purpose of producing, harvesting, transferring, or selling cannabis. Um, to any person. So these license types will be available. The board is actually directed by the, uh, the statute to begin issuing these licenses by July 1st of this year. Um, and we are on track to do that. Um, we've got our uh, vendor that is supporting us in building out uh, the licensing portal to accommodate these uh, propagation cultivation applications. Um, so we hope to be able to begin accepting these applications probably within the next um, three months. So stay tuned for more information on that. So with that, I'll jump into our, um, our adult use program licensing data, and we're going to start out just our first couple of slides, uh, offer a little bit of a retrospective of 2023. Um, just uh, an overview, a picture of how many sort of submissions that the licensing team has received just in the 2023 calendar year. So 500 or 864 um, employee ID cards have been issued uh, in 2023. Um, 3,683 product, products were registered in 2023. And we've issued 303 license applications um, in last during the last year. So that's a little bit of an overview of our application numbers. And then the next slide is a retrospective on product registration submissions. So um, this is a little bit of a picture of what types of products are um, being submitted for registration. So this data will probably look familiar to everybody. We've, we're still um, around 
of those products that are submitted for registration are flour. Um, and then it's broken down from there from, I think the next most common is extracts and then edibles, then tinctures and topicals. You can barely see it and it's not um, represented percentage. I think it's uh, um, less than 1% topicals we have there. And then that dark sliver 3% um, is other, uh, other products, which I believe is primarily clones at this point. So that is your retrospective of the year. And I'm gonna move, unless there are any questions about that, I'm gonna move into our regular um, reporting on starting with cultivation license. <laughs> Just be curious to see how that changes over the next year, recognizing that most markets start as a flower heavy market and move into products yep. thereafter. Yes, we will keep an eye on that as time goes on. <clears throat> so starting with our cultivation license numbers, Here's the picture of total issued cultivation cultivation licenses by their type and tier. Um, so we continue to be primarily an outdoor and mixed market. Um, that really hasn't changed. So this is a picture of our current active licenses that are issued for each type and tier of cultivation. Um, and a note here that if a licensee expires without renewing, or renews with a change in their tier or their type of cultivation. Um, the numbers here reflect the new currently active issued licenses. So this is intended to reflect um, a up to the moment picture of where our licensees stand. Um, and that this slide reflects cultivation renewals by type and tier. Um, so you can see that we are we are chugging along with our first year cultivation renewals. Um, we're looking at around half of our initial first year cultivation licensees being in the door for renewal. And actually this next slide um, gives you a little bit of a, of a picture of what, um, what that renewal process looks like for our cultivation licensees. So that first column on the left, initial licenses issued um, sort of reflects that all of the all of the initial cultivation license that the that the board issued. Uh, the next column is renewals. So that number captures all cultivation renewals that have either been issued or in that pipeline. Um, so we are right now around halfway through the renewals process for our outdoor and mixed cultivators. Um, and that is we are sort of right on track since we um, were issuing these license types. Um, I think all the way through August. We did close that uh, window for applicants to apply for an outdoor mixed cultivation license um, at the end of April, but we continue to issue those licenses uh, throughout the spring and the summer. So we're around halfway um, at this point of renewing our first sort of year of cultivation licensees. Um, and then that column to the right, um, shows how many of each type and tier of cultivation license has either relinquished their license or has let their license expire. Um, and so far about 8% of our cultivation licensees are relinquishing their license. So overall picture of cultivation licensees. And I think the, the next slide, I'm doing the same thing with the manufacturers. Um, so an overall picture of our manufacturer licenses, um, it, number of issued in that first column, renewals in the middle, and then number of relinquished or expired off to the right. Um, and here, obviously, we've got a little bit less, uh, just where we are in the cycle, we are not quite as far along as we are for the cultivators, for the manufacturers, since we started issuing those licenses um, late in the summer of 2022. Um, so we're not quite up to, you know, the same, the same rate that we are um, for cultivation, but still a little bit of an overview of where we are. And then here is the same overview summary for the rest of our license types. Um, so the number of issued retailers, testing labs, wholesalers, and integrated licensees. Um, the number of those licensees that have either renewed already or are in process of renewing, and then the number that have relinquished their license. 
And then this slide um, just takes a look at the relinquishment rate by the priority status. Um, so rather than breaking it down by each individual license type, which the former slides do, this uh, just takes a look at who is relinquishing based on their priority status. And this relinquishment rate um, reflects almost exactly the proportion of standard economic empowerment and social equity licensees. And I keep popping through. So looking at that relinquishment, looking for the reasons for a relinquishment rate, um, you have seen this data before. This is just an update um, based on any additional licensees that have indicated they are letting their, um, they are relinquishing their license. So um, the numbers still continue to be primarily in that personal category. The reason given for relinquishing the license are personal reasons. Um, and then the next slide dives in a little bit deeper and you can see that the costs um, are really, are, are growing. The, the factors given for relinquishment um, are primarily cost if they're not something else, some other personal reason. Okay, so now we'll go into changes um, when cultivators and manufacturers are going in for their license renewal, um, what portion of them are changing, um, either, their, either the type of cultivation they're doing or what tier they are growing at or manufacturing at. Um, so 78% are not changing. They're staying where they are as they go into the renewal process. 13% um, of all cultivators and manufacturers are changing a tier. Um, so they're either moving up or down, and we'll look, we'll dive into that on the next, within the next couple of slides. 6% um, are changing the type of cultivation that they're doing, um, and then 3% of cultivators are changing both the type of cultivation they're doing and their tier. So we're looking at the, the whole picture of cultivate, uh, cultivators and manufacturers, but some of these categories only apply to cultivators. So just diving in a little bit more deeply here, we're looking at um, just cultivators now and their change the changes that they're making upon renewal. And you can see um, how people are shifting. So sort of an e almost an even mix here of, of people shifting um, either from outdoor to mixed cultivation, mixed to outdoor or indoor to mixed. And so far, there is nobody who has um, shifted from outdoor mixed to indoor. And now we're looking more closely at the license tier change. And you can see the majority of folks that are making a change in their tier are increasing their tier. A small percentage are decreasing. So that, this one applies to both cultivators and manufacturers. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna keep going unless I get interrupted with questions. So license canopy capacity, here's our, um, our sort of chart that demonstrates how much licensed canopy we have capacity, we are um, capable of growing here in Vermont. Um, and this outdoor license canopy number continues to decline and the indoor license canopy number continues to rise pretty steadily since the end of the outdoor harvest, which is very natural. Um, so we're up about 3,500 square feet of indoor licensed canopy capacity since December. Those are the only license types that are open, right? Right. That's correct. Yeah. So next slide shows our comparison between capacity and utilization. Um, and again, a reminder that the total number of licensees surveyed for this utilization percentage is still around 15% of our grow capacity. So we're making that um, utilized canopy uh, percentage um, is a projection based on a subset of our licensees. And we're hovering around the same utilization rate for both indoor and outdoor since just actually since November, we're just a, around the same percentage for both. So that uh, utilization rate is not changing much over time. Bryn, does the licensed canopy number include the, the licensees that are shifting up? 
Like is it the is it a point in time or is it current? So this number reflects our current um, the the amount of capacity for who we have currently licensed. So it reflects those changes in in tier. Okay. Um, as Thank of, you. I think yesterday this data this was updated. Okay. If we're talking about tearing up, are, are, are we seeing a trend in like one, two, or one to three in terms of tier size? Like yeah, we can tiering? we can dive in to that a little bit more deeply. I think the majority of our increases are tier ones um, up to a tier. My guess is that it's from tier one to tier two, um, and not a double jump. But we can we can dive into that. Yeah, I'm trying to think. There's so many, <clears throat> obviously so many factors that go into it, right? We've got. 25 people that haven't renewed or relinquished their license so far. We're not, we're only getting a couple new licensees each month, it seems, over the last couple of weeks, but people are also jumping tier sizes. So I'm just trying to get a picture of are we losing total potential canopy um, that could be grown based off of how things are shifting on, on renewal, especially yes. before we get to the outdoor yeah. reopening. Yeah. Um, and I think that this is the slide that that demonstrates that the most clearly is where we are actually with our current licensed uh, canopy capacity. But we can um, we can certainly take a look more closely at how people are changing um, when they do change too. Yeah, this is total canopy, not flower canopy. Just yeah. folks listening. This is the utilized. Correct. Okay, I'm going to move on to our retail locations, our areas of density chart. Um, there's no new additions from actually our November numbers. We've had no increase here, a uh, total increase here since I think October. Um, so I have not included the map because essentially we're the same here. I think one has shifted from in the queue to licensed, um, but overall we are looking at the same numbers here. Do you know where the uh, relinquished retail license was? Not off the top of my head, uh -huh. but I bet we can get the answer by the end of the meeting. Okay. Okay. It was not in an area of density, and I'm presuming that these numbers haven't changed. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, so as long as everybody's ready, if you can wait, hold on. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that our licensing team will, will be able to provide us an answer at some point. Um, but I would say move into the next few slides um, are just a summary of where we are with pre-qualification. Since this process uh, opened up at the beginning of December, um, I thought it would be useful to take a look at uh, how many folks we've gotten in for their pre-qualification application and interview and what the outcome of those conversations has been. So uh, this slide just gives us the data here, the numbers of how many pre-qualification applications have been received by license type. Um, so our tier one cultivation um, applications continue to be our most popular, um, followed up by our tier one manufacturers currently. So a total of 40 in the last essentially two months since pre-qual has been open. Um, and then the next couple of slides is just I provide a little bit of narrative information about how these are going, the specifically the pre-qualification conversations that are happening um, between uh, applicants and staff. So since December 1st, we've had 28 pre-qualification meetings with pre-qualification applicants. And the board will remember that the whole process of pre-qualification was really designed to help applicants better understand what is required of them to both obtain a, a full license, Canvas establishment license, and also maintain that license. So in that vein, we've uh, seen some common themes in these conversations, um, which I've outlined here. The cost benefit analysis has been a big um, point of conversation. And what our staff are doing is really educating about the um, initial sort of upfront cost to obtain a license and then the future regulatory costs of um, maintaining a cannabis business to just help applicants understand um, how viable their business model is. 
Also, space limitations has been a big topic of conversation. Um, both licensing staff and compliance staff are participating in these conversations. So we've been doing education about space requirements so that applicants can either configure their space or reconfigure their space if they've gone that far um, in a way that's gonna achieve compliance with their site visit and also maximize their potential production capacity. Um, business plan, I think that's, that's been a topic of conversation um, quite a bit, helping licensees better understand how the industry works um, so that they can craft a business plan as a part of their full application. Um, some educating about products and the requirements around products, so product registration, white labeling, manufacturing, wholesale options, um, so that applicants have a better understanding about how they will get their product to market. And then timelines for licensure is another big um, topic of conversation so that applicants really understand what to expect for both the timing of their, um, of their initial license, their full Canvas establishment license, and also what will be required for them upon renewal. Um, and that will really help applicants be able to plan for both the startup of their operations so they know when they should really begin sort of um, uh, paying their rent and getting their insurance in place and all of that and also um, helping them understand early on how they can remain operational um, a year from now. If they're continuing to operate and they wanna renew their license, we're educating people early on that you do have to, you do have to get uh, renewed each year. Um, it's not a one, one and done kind of thing. This is great. Um, you know, I, I, will, I remember Massachusetts would do something very similar with their social equity applicants only. And it had the effect of a lot of prospective social equity applicants deciding not to get a license. Are you seeing any of that as far as you can tell us why it's too early to tell? Um, it's a little too early for us to tell, but um, because I don't think there have been any uh, pre-qualification applicants that have withdrawn just yet. Um, it, but, did, it looked like the most conversations have been around tier one, though. Has there been any folks that maybe had big stars in their eyes that are like, okay, maybe I should start smaller. Does that make sense? Well, I don't know if I have an answer to that right now. <laughs> I can um, point out what people have been, have like identified as being issues that maybe have interfered with their, with their grand plan. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. No, well, no, it's a great question. And I just, I'm not sure we have those details yet, but, um, Maybe we will at the next. At the it's all follow data right now, I guess. Yeah, it really is. It's anecdotal at this point. Um, you, may, you may not have gotten to any of the retail pre quals yet, but um, okay. Um, are you guys going through the areas of density with them as well? Just trying to like help them understand the competition and market saturation. That is a part. That's definitely a part of what's talked about in the. Um, so this slide just uh, details some of the issue, the compliance issues that staff have identified in their conversations around prequal. So, um, you know, the other sort of point of the prequalification process is that it's designed to uncover potential problems with an application early on so that we have time, um, the applicant has time to correct that deficiency or to identify those, or for us to really to identify those circumstances where um, a license uh, applicant might be inappropriate for licensure because um, for one reason or another. And it helps us identify those, those issues early on um, before the applicant has invested significant resources into what is essentially sort of a non-compliant business model. So the, um, this is sort of a list of those compliance issues that have been identified so far just in those 28 prequal conversations that have happened so far. So I think this is actually a really good demonstration of how well prequal is working, even right out of right out of the gate. So multiple applicants, pre-qualification pre applicants, um, have been identified as folks that would be um, out of compliance with the one license rule. Um, they are proposing working with business partners or having other principals and controllers that either already have a license, a separate license of the same type or are simultaneously applying for a separate license of the same type. I think that there have been more than two of these. 
Um, co-location issue, uh, there's been a proposal to operate two cultivation establishments in one location that would have exceeded the plant canopy limit for the largest open cultivation tier. So we were able to identify that early on before um, the, the applicant invested significant resources into that business plan. Uh, presumptive disqualification. So there, um, we've identified applicants with presumptively disqualifying criminal convictions um, that could either disqualify or delay their full application. And staff is um, walking these applicants through the process of how to overcome a pre presumptive disqualification early on so that doesn't result in a delay later on when they're fully ready to operate. Um, retail space build out specifications. Um, we've had applicants who have retail plans that included non compliant ID check and product placement locations. Um, so that plan could be corrected prior to investing uh, all the money and building out a retail establishment that would not have been compliant upon inspection. And then testing and product registration. And this is again, I think, goes really towards that cost benefit analysis um, that we talked about earlier. Um, that some folks are coming in with a plan to cultivate multiple strains before they understand that, the, um, that there are testing requirements and product registration requirements that really would impact um, those plans. So I won't do I this every month. Question. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. I have a quick question. You may have said it and I may have missed it. So for folks who would qualify for social equity, are we moving them or connecting them with um, the technical assistance and the grant application during this process, or are we waiting until they're fully licensed for that? No, we are not waiting until they're fully licensed. We are, um, anybody who's identified as a social equity applicant needs to go, um, would go immediately to the, to the board at the, at the next board meeting to be, um, confirmed as a social equity applicant. And we're connecting those, um, folks to ACCD immediately. No, we don't wait for their full license. Excellent, excellent. Okay. Um, I want, what I was about to say was that I'm not going to do this every month, but I thought it would be helpful to take to just have an overview of how they're going so far. And also, I'm also happy to do it every month if you would like, um, or give you any other information about prequal that might be helpful. Okay. I have heard from at least a handful of prospective cultivators that. It's going great for them, and they're very uh, happy with the pre-qualification process so far. That's fabulous. So I was going to move on to the compliance data, um, unless we want to pause here for any reason. Or were we able to find an answer to your question earlier? You know, I thought about it. I think I know. It was probably to the acquisition of the Zen Bar. They had to give up their retail as part of the integrated license. Okay. Okay. Um, that retailer is in branding. Okay. So, compliance data. Starting with the summary of the compliance work that's been done since uh, December 16th. Um, we've received a total of nine new complaints since then. Um, compliance team has observed two product destructions uh, as a result either of a compliance issue or um, a wrap up of operations. Compliance team has undertaken eight new investigations, um, the subject of which are listed below. So scope of license activity, advertising compliance, on-site consumption, an unlicensed establishment, employee misconduct, theft of product, and general compliance are all the new investigations as of mid-December. Um, we've issued three, oops, sorry. We've issued three notices of violation. Um, one was about a security violation and two were relevant to employee misconduct or product theft. And we've issued four letters of warning. Um, and those included, um, Compliance issues around retail record keeping, advertising violations, and operating without finalizing the licensing process and actually having their license issued. So next, I'll go into a, a summary of our advertising review. And 
I know that I mentioned, I think I um, pulled this from the slide deck the la last month, but we decided to include it again because there has been a significant uptick in the number of advertising submissions that the team has received, which is great because I think it uh, reflects that licensees are understanding what they need to do before they um, publish an advertisement. So just in the month of January, since January 1st, we've received a total of 41 advertise, pro, proposed advertising submissions. Um, and then we've got a breakdown there on the left of what those submissions um, were all about. Standard submissions, about half were standard submissions. Six were resubmissions. 11 were requests for more information or sort of just a request for education around what the advertising requirements are. And then we received um, four that were multiple advertisements in a single submission, and you can see the breakdown there. Um, the review outcomes that were that we approved 20, um, and that is our, our initial, like after an initial review, the outcome was an approval. Um, six were initially denied, um, but you can see the asterisk there, which notes that of those denials, um, all of them were cured after resub being resubmitted to the board. Um, and then let's see, 10, we per of 10 of those, of those 41, we provided education or clarification, two were partial approvals, and five were um, are still outstanding as of today. So uh, that actually gives a good picture of what it looked like, how quickly we're responding to these. Um, I think that we received five um, submissions just since Monday. So we are regularly replying to these within, um, I would say like, 48 to 72 hours, um, and we're always replying to them within seven days. And then finally, at the bottom right-hand corner there, you can see the reasons for denial, um, which are staying pretty steady, primarily uh, lack of audience composition data or um, that the advertisement contains false or misleading claims. Um, and then there, have been, there were a couple that either the health warning was um, minuscule or the ad offered some sort of prize or giveaway. So that's the summary of our advertising review work. And that is all I've got for you besides our staff recommendations for licensure. And very <clears throat> quickly on a, on a semi-related topic for what you just covered, obviously we've seen a few couple of um, advertisements in Vermont-based newspapers for out-of-state dispensaries or cannabis businesses, would you just for people listening, explain how we kind of, since we don't have jurisdiction over those licensees from the newspaper, how we kind of talk with our um, states around us that might uh, yes. have control over those licensees. Yep. So just as a reminder, we, um, the CCB has jurisdiction and authority over our own Vermont state licensed entities. We do not have uh, jurisdiction over either um, you know, our, our newspapers in the state or licensees in other states. So what we do when we when we do see a, an advertisement for um, a cannabis establishment from another state is contact our partners in that state to inform them of the advertisement. And we have some good relationships with regulators um, across the border in New York and in Massachusetts. And um, that's how we handle it when we when we are made aware of those types of ads. Thank you. Okay. Um, generally, how quick does it take to get an advertisement reviewed and some sort of action taken? Oh, we must not have been listening. <laughs> we have. Um, it's in there. Uh, no, it's not. But I, but I, I think <laughs> I just said it. It's not listed. It's not listed here. But we um, always get to those submissions within seven days. Um, and I would say the majority of the time um, we get to them in 48 hours to 72 hours, especially if they are submitted and they are compliant. Those like approvals, um, the approvals tend to be turned around pretty quickly. If the submission is a request for information, um, those can sometimes take a little bit longer, but always within seven days. Great. Okay. later. Did I did I see a, a proposed change to the language around advertising? I was just trying to look for the bill number, but a proposed change to the language around advertising and the legislature? No. Not this year. 
Okay. I think we requested that the like authority for us to charge a fee for an advertisement review be struck just to make it clear okay. to the yeah. industry that we're not intending to charge a fee and we never will. That's the legislature okay. forced us to. Okay. Just to, thank you. We never had the authority to charge a fee. There was just a reference in the statute to a fee. Oh, okay. But we never actually had that authority or had a fee in the statute. <laughs> So okay, he was contemplated at some point, but. Okay. Okay. Um, so if you are ready, here are your um, staff recommendations for initial licensure. So these uh, applicants have met all of the requirements for their adult use cannabis establishment license that are in statute and rule. We have four this month. Um, so we've got Green Star Hill applying for an indoor tier one small cultivation, cultivation license. Atlas Cultivars also applying for a tier one indoor cultivation license. Um, we've got Taconic Chronic who are applying for a manufacturing tier one license and Haybud Collective applying for a retail license. Um, and then the next several slides are uh, the, the licensees that are up for renewal. So we've got 67 renewals for you this month and I'm not gonna read them, but I will pause on each one. And again, this report will be posted to the website by the end of the day um, for folks to go and take a look. And is this posted to the agenda as well? Yeah, the agenda has all, I don't think there was any change from the agenda to the, the who you see here. So if you were on the agenda, then you are here in the report. I'll email last too. Yeah. Well, done. Oh, actually, no, no. Sixty-seven recommended renewals. Great. Any questions for Brent? Nope. I'm done asking questions. <laughs> um, for now. All right. Well, uh, any discussion about any of those? Nope. All right. Was there a motion to approve the uh, recommendations? I move that the board accept each of the recommendations as presented by staff in this meeting. Uh, we'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. All right. Um, well, why don't we just turn to public comment um, and uh, we'll start with anyone who joined by uh, the video link. If you did, just raise your virtual hand if you'd like to comment. And then after we get through those, we'll move to people that joined by phone. Okay, <clears throat> looks like the first person is Grayson. Hi. Can you Hello. guys hear me all right? Yes. Yep. Thanks for renewing us for another year. I'm, my name is Grayson Glosser. I'm the development director for Extract Vermont. Great to be back for another year. Um, I was phoning in to comment about just the guidelines about plastic in packaging and just kind of to maybe give my opinion just on you maybe some suggestions and some feedback that we have as a manufacturer um, we make a lot of different um, edible products in particular and something that's been it's been really difficult for us to have um, to really identify some solid packaging, especially because it needs to be child resistant. And that paired with the milligram caps has made um, finding packaging really difficult. You know, something that was working well was those safely locked pouches. Um, and now with those going away, and I'm not sure, I, I don't, I'm not quite sure why. Um, just kind of being able to I, I kind of want to just open the door for a little more conversation on what 
what drives the decision making on what's allowable as a plastic alternative and what isn't. You know, I, I remember hearing, you know, something of managing one of the previous meetings talking about how PLA is a common industrial compostable plastic, whereas um, PHA, which is what Humidico offers, is something that's home compostable and how, you know, PLA, if it's put in a landfill, won't break down in a reasonable amount of time. And I think that's a good, that's one good metric to measure by, but I think there's a few more that we could discuss because something that I think, you know, that that's one that's really important to me. I'm a synthetic chemist and looking at something like a polyolefin, like polypropylene, polyethylene, it does bug me that those are just gonna be persistent in the environment. And as they break down, they're gonna generate microplastics. And that's kind of the other part of this as well is that, you know, something like polylactic acid or PLA, while it won't necessarily degrade particularly quickly, it will break down into just lactic acid, which is a biocompatible, you know, pollutant, I'll put in air quotes, because lactic acid, you know, is in is very prevalent in as a biological um, molecule. Um, so, you know, having that consideration, especially because, you know, a three ounce glass jar is 90 grams and, you know, we'll go through, you know, that shipping that from several thousand miles away, the environmental effects of that, plus, you know, any of the liners, um, a lot of pre-roll tubes come wrapped, you know, the glass comes wrapped in plastic, unfortunately, um, just trying to have a broader consideration of what goes into that because taking into consideration that you know how much how energy intensive it is to ship and recycle glass it might be outweigh you know that environmental impact might be greater than that of something like PLA which while it will take longer to break down it may not have that large environmental impact and kind of the last little you know so that's kind of the material choice and you know I be happy to talk to anybody about this. I am a pretty big nerd. I tried to tone it down there as much as I could. Um, that's so that's that's as much as I could. But the other part is, you know, food safety. There's a pretty stark lack of things are, that are able to be hermetically sealed, and particularly with confections, something like a caramel um, or chocolate, where moisture is going to drastically diminish the quality of the product. Like a caramel is hygroscopic and it's gonna pull moisture from the air. Um, something really needs to be hermetically sealable and something like an aluminum tin, they advertise that they're hermetically sealed, but they fail pretty basic water tests. Um, and you know, things that are even watertight are not necessarily airtight. Um, so that's kind, of, that's kind of just my little note on packaging and that's something that we're struggling with as a manufacturer that makes a lot of different products. Um, and just kind of giving my input on what, you know, the different avenues of plastic that get input. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Grace. And this is certainly something that we're trying to take very seriously and appreciate your input. Okay, next up we have Jesse Lynn. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Jesse Lynn Dolan. I'm the founder of the Vermont Cannabis Nurses Association, also the president of the American Nurses Association here in Vermont. I'm a CCB vendor trainer for bud tenders, and I also run a free nurse hotline for <clears throat> consumers. Uh, two things I want to quickly touch on is labeling and education. Um, as I get more hotline calls, educate more bud tenders, and visit more dispensaries, it's glaringly apparent we, we need more labeling directives, transparency, and enforcement. What I'm seeing is packages that are dated over a year old. I'm seeing THC listed on oral and edible products with zero information as far as whether that's an isolate, distillate, or full spectrum. I believe you guys at the CCB are aware the drastic difference between product effects from both therapeutic and consumer safety perspectives. And uh, if you don't, please help me provide some education for that to you. I'm seeing added terpenes listed, but not which terpenes they are. Terpenes can be serious allergens and need to be transparent, let alone the differing levels of euphoria, also known as intoxication that they can bring. 
I'm seeing topicals with added essential oils, but not listed what essential oils are out there. My son, for example, is dangerously allergic to lavender and would end up in the emergency room if he were to touch that. I had one caller take 10 mLs instead of 10 milligrams of a THC product because of the labeling. And I had another caller think they had to take all 25 milligram gummies as one dose. So the lack of transparency is an absolute consumer safety issue and needs to be addressed. Not doing so will allow legislators and policymakers to not only question the program, but add stigma and more prohibitive laws, understandably so if we don't do better. Uh, secondly, <clears throat> we're almost a year and a half into the program and there's been zero attention and focus on education. As an educator, I get plenty of feedback, including people who've taken other approved vendor trainings, stating they have barely any education on consumer safety and practically no up-to-date compliance information. I will continue to ask, even beg you, to prioritize education for consumer safety, especially as we head into legislative session with policy changes on the line. I would love to be able to testify that the adult use program is doing what's necessary for safety, but to do so again, I ask you to prioritize proper labeling and education. Please let me know who I can connect with in a timely manner as uh, Carrie and Nellie were working on that, but are no longer <clears throat> working with you guys. Let me know how we can expedite some of these serious concerns and needs. Um, I'm beginning to meet regularly with Prevention Works, with the Substance Misuse Prevention Council, with the Agency of Aging, with the Department of Labor. And I'd love to be able to say that consumer safety is up to par and a focus of the adult use program. So please help that be a conversation we continue to have. Um, <clears throat> there, there are some serious concerns with the lack of la uh, labeling and education. And lastly, just to quickly mention, I think some of the charts you guys put up were great. The product wheel listing the top products, cultivation wheel, but on the one product wheel, I would mention that there was not the percentages listed. And for someone who's colorblind, that makes it very challenging to understand the graph. So. Um, just to throw that out there as well. So I'd love to touch base with someone if you guys let me know who's working on education and how we can look at labeling to make that much more uh, consumer safety friendly. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jessie. Okay, we have Kirsten now. Hello. Just, are you, oh. uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so my name is Kirsten, and um, I have a tier one license for my company called Bliss Point Chocolates. And I recently um, applied for a waiver to get a waiver for um, my reapplication fee. Um, the argument I made was that, you know, women as an economic empowerment uh, license should be getting a, a waiver also. Um, uh, sim one of the main reasons is that I saw that that cult tier one cultivators were getting a waiver on their manufacturing license. Is that right? Did I get that right? No, it's we're not only allowed to we, like because this affects state revenue. We're only allowed to waive application fees when the legislature authorizes us to, and they said only social equity applicants. And then even then, they've got a progressive waiver process that, where they, have, after five years, pay the full amount of their fee. Okay. Um, I thought, was there something about the manufacturer or the, the cultivators getting a break on their manufacturing license? I, no? Well, this really isn't a Q&A session, but maybe we can connect with you offline about it. Uh, with, it, but in general, we're not allowed to, this is one of the areas where we're not allowed to issue a waiver. Um, you know, this isn't about kind of compliance with the regulation. This is a, a fee that's set by the state that, you know, we really don't have much control over. Okay. All right. I just thought I read, I had read that somewhere that um, met, that cultivators were also getting an extra like added, but I, I, I must be wrong about that. So sorry about that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Next up is Tito. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Um, so I just want to say that it is getting crowded in the grow community. 
And it feels like it's time to cap those higher license tiers. That hopefully everybody's having a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Tito. Okay, Jesse Spear. Hey, how's it going? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Sorry, I got on the meeting a little late. This is the comments section, right? Yes, it is. Okay. So I just had one comment regarding product registration. So I'd just like to say um, our compliance officer is awesome. Had a really good relationship with her. She's been more than helpful. I'm really happy with working with her and she's doing an amazing job. But it seems like she may be has a bigger workload than, and I might be wrong, but talking to other uh, companies and cultivators that are out of the Chittenden County area, their compliance officers might not have as big of a workload. And I know like she's gone out of her way and worked um, on times where she wasn't getting paid for overtime just to help out the cultivators, which is a big deal because we have a perishable product. And if we can't get it out in a timely manner, um, it hurts us significantly. And is there any way to either approve overtime or have different staffing or, or provide more staffing for product registration for the compliance officers that have a bigger workload or an area that has, has more cultivators or stores? Yeah, thank you for the comment. And we are constantly evaluating those types of things and asking our friends at the legislature for more support when it's needed. Okay, we have Bushy Beard Cultivation up next. Hello, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Hello? Okay. Um, I just wanted to piggyback on what Tito had said and was just curious if there was anything coming down the pipe with capping the larger licenses and if there was any plans because like Tito said, it does seem like, you know, the market is reaching a saturation point so i just kind of wanted to piggyback on what he said and see if there was any plans in the future for doing something like that all right thanks for the comment uh jane lanza hi thanks this is jane from family tree we're mixed tier three we do our sun grown on the larger side and the small tier one for the indoor is part of that mix. And we manufacture. And we have been um, gratefully participating in the industry since the inauguration and adapting to all the changes. One that I'm particularly noticing is the amount of retailers who get their own cultivation and manufacturing license. And I'm just curious, from a cultivator or manufacturer point of view myself, if there is a direct avenue that you guys might see down the pipeline for direct to consumer from the farmer's point of view to catch up. Great, thanks for that comment. I, I would just pause right here and just know that, you know, public comment sessions are not Q and A sessions, essentially we can't, make policy on the fly or deal with everyone's specific concerns. You can submit questions to the board and we try to, um, in my opening comments and or else elsewhere, try and address specific questions or common themes that come up over and over again. Um, and if you do have specific questions, you can certainly just uh, reach out to, I think it's what, comment at ccb.org or something. It's info at ccb.org. It's a portal on the website. Okay. Yeah. So CCB on info the email yeah. address. Yeah. There's also a public comment. But those are also that that takes the legislature to kind of authorize that type of, of license, Jane. So I would encourage you to talk to your elected officials. Thank you. I am in that process. Great. That's they the do they do that. listen, I will say. Like they not you know, it's 180 people, and not everyone has the same kind of ability to move legislation, but they, your legislature will listen to you uh, if you're if you're struggling. Yeah. OK, Eli Harrington. Eli. 
Eli, you're muted if you're talking. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Sorry about that. Uh, with the discussion of possible event permits or any off-site sales, delivery or special events, I'd like to float the idea that uh, a portion of those sales must come from independent cultivators. Uh, that if we are going to start doing uh, off-site sales and off-site consumption, that we build in a niche specifically for independent cultivators, because I do see a lot of consolidation happening uh, at the retailer level. Um, and it is easier for a lot of these larger folks to just get a retail license than for those of us who are smaller to, uh, to get one, until something like a catering license maybe exists in the future. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, to float that idea that as we talk about opening up new markets with events and offsite consumption, uh, we in statute uh, carve out some space for independent cultivators so that way we don't see every retailer working every wedding only selling their own products uh, and that we've got a space there by statute because I know there's a lot of good intentions, but uh, capitalism going to catalyze and we're uh, we're starting to see that. So. Uh, there will be an advocacy day at the State House next Thursday, the 8th. I hope to see a lot of folks there. Uh, people can email me or check our Instagram for more details, but uh, we will be there the afternoon of next Thursday, the 8th. So a good time to catch up with other folks in the industry. Thank you. Thanks, Eli. Okay, Casey, you're up next. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. So uh, my name is Casey Carton. I live in North Hero, uh, Island Craft Cannabis LLC, a tier one mixed that is uh, just on the cusp of um, going to market, so to speak. And I want to say thank you to everybody. I really want to, uh, you know, not only just with the state of Vermont and putting this together, but all the hard work from uh, the entrepreneurs, the growers, everybody. Um, I've been, I was born and raised in Vermont. I would be considered very small. Um, so we're on like month 14 of, of being live here in this little state and very quickly we're saturated. So I am going to sort of mirror that commentary about the larger scale licensures and ask for all consideration for the little guys, whatever that can be. Uh, and uh, duly noted about reaching out to you know, legislation and so on. But thank you to you guys. Um, and that's the comment I had today. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Casey. Okay, John, you're up next. Okay, yes, hi. So I have two things. I'm just going to um, mirror what was just spoken about, the uh, oversaturation of the market. Uh, the amount of product out there is exceeding the, the demand, um, you know, boots on the ground kind of information. Uh, the other thing is I'm a, a handicap in a wheelchair. And um, during my initial inspection, I was informed by my compliance officer that a three foot handicap pathway was included in my square foot canopy. And, um, you know, I, and, and one of the things that she had told me was that, you know, the plants are going to grow into the area. And I said, well, no, I can't have them grow in because I need to get through there with a three foot wheelchair. Uh, you know, some people can turn sideways and walk through. So I'm hoping that there's like maybe in the future some sort of waiver that um, somebody can um, fill out or apply for if they're in, uh, you know, an immobile situation where, you know, I'm going to take up more of a, a pathway or a square foot of my canopy, you know, like a three foot aisle down the center that's not included. Um, OK, that's it. Yeah, thanks, John. Okay, Jody, you are up next. Yes, hi, my name is Jody Horner. I'm calling from Vermont Green Castle Reserve. We are a tier one cultivator in Johnson. We had manufactured some product, hash infused uh, two harvest lots ago, and we still have not found approved packaging um, for that harvest lot. There is a waiver currently out there for glass or other non-plastic jars with metal wood bamboo lids that utilize a plastic or rubber gasket. I wrote a waiver to have that expanded to hash infused and it was rejected. Currently that waiver only applies to cannabis flower and the real issue is 
child resistant. So we need those plastic threads for child resistant. We don't need them for regular cannabis flowers. So this waiver doesn't seem to do anybody any good. Um, furthermore, and I'll end here, the suggested websites on the packaging guidance page, um, I've contacted all of them and none of those were approved by the CCB. So it's a real struggle to find child resistant without plastic threads and the waiver request being denied makes no sense because we really only need the plastic threads for child resistant. Thank you. Sorry. Nick. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hey, everybody. This is Nick with Emerald Visions. Uh, thanks for uh, for everything you all do. And um, just wanted to kind of echo the the statement of what uh, several other cultivators said about the crowded, flooded market that we're experiencing right now. Um, it's, I don't know, we all keep hoping that it's going to get better, but um, I don't know, we all thought that it was just like kind of a end of the year. People didn't want to add any more to the inventory in December, but this is all, it just keeps getting pushed on week after week, hearing the same thing from a lot of our partners just saying like, I don't know, they have way too much flour and most of them are saying even that 12 cultivators are going through their door every day and they're having to unfortunately turn them down. And these are all, uh, there's quite a few people in desperate situations. And I know I'm not the only person that really is feeling the pain right now of just how saturated the market is. And just imagine if this would have been an outdoor year that was um, not a complete disaster and probably would have seen twice as much saturation and even more people not renewing. But yeah, I know that um, this is probably not even within the guidelines of the CCB to do too much about it. Probably more of a legislature change, but I don't know. I just kind of wanted to let everyone know that they're not in this alone, that everyone's struggling. Uh, keep your head up, I guess. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Looks like that was Anyone our last comment. Yeah, yeah okay. Sure. How are you guys? Good. Um, Randy from Doya here. I just wanted to, you know, echo what Nick said and a couple other people. The market is um, very saturated at the moment, um, and I'm hoping that you guys will take into consideration licenses that are being issued going forward and canopy space that's allowed at the moment. Um, try and find that like happy medium where everybody can survive that's in it right now. Um, it's financially debilitating trying to pay, you know, $10,000 power bill just for a tier one. Um, I can't imagine tier two people and higher that are having a hard time selling product right now. Um, granted, the tourism uh, right now is bad because of the weather. But uh, like he said, with the outdoor, had we had a great year, it would be pretty crazy right now. And uh, nobody seems to know when product's going to start moving again. Um, we're just barely moving a quarter pound here and there. Normally we move, you know, two, three, four, five pounds um, every week, every other week, and just sales have been pretty stagnant right now. So I hope that uh, you guys take that into consideration with the available canopy and how many more licenses that you guys are going to issue going forward. And that's all I got to say. Thanks. Thanks, Randy. Dave, you are up next. Oh, thanks. Um, I just want to kind of throw in sort of like from from the other side of that equation, you know, like um, we love Randy stuff, by the way, it's fantastic. Um, Nick's too. Um, lots of all make great flower. Um, you know, this is going to happen every year. Um, we're going to hit the, the low point in the market uh, right around now. Uh, and that's going to hit at the same time as the outdoor stuff is hitting the market. And that's really dangerous. Uh, but unavoidable uh, just because of the way the calendar works. Uh, and so, you know, I would just urge everyone, A, not to panic uh, and, you know, to the best you can, uh, you know, hold on. Um, but also, you know, there is actually a bill that's being considered now in the legislature. Uh, it's a short form bill, so there's no details. It's just a discussion uh, around uh, sort of like a license moratorium potentially. Um, and I think, you know, if 
folks are interested in that sort of thing, and I, I, I'm, I'm in very active listening mode on that. Um, if folks are interested in that sort of thing, um, really urge them to reach out to, uh, to their reps in the house, um, and and talk with them about that um, because it is, you know, it, it is actively being considered in the legislature and the CCB. You know, we can we can argue over their legal authority to impose caps on uh, all sorts of license types or, you know, just what they've already done on certain tiers and closing and opening. Um, but, um, you know, I think certainly getting a um, some direction from the legislature would help um, you know, Julie, James and, and Kyle um, make the right decisions as well. So um, that's all. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Okay, up next is Liz. Hi there, I'm Liz from Green Mountain Gourmet Cannabis Company. We make all sorts of unique edible products um, from olive oil to peanut butter and strawberry jam. Um, and we've noticed, a, oh, I'm so sorry, my dog in the background. Um, but the uh, we've noticed that another company has had some products that have gone bad and there's the new interbatch testing for every three months for potency um and you know i'm not trying to be a business owner shooting myself in the foot of adding more cost um but i think that adding in some parameters for food safety would be really important as well we take it really seriously at my facility um but having interbatch testing for making sure that there's not any bacterial growth or anything going on in those batches is super important yeah, thanks, Liz. Thank you. Um, any other public comments? If you join by video, raise your virtual hand. If you join by phone, you can hit star six to unmute your phone. Uh, yeah, this is Nate from uh, Pressure Lab Cultivation. Can you guys hear me okay? We can. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, you know, make a couple points or comments um, to what Tito and Nick was saying about the market saturation. Uh, me and a buddy of mine were looking at some numbers, um, John, who made a comment earlier, and just with the tier ones, uh, with outdoor and indoor, 85% um, of the state's projected canopy needs are already met just with tier ones. Um, so it is saturated. I think that it's safe to say, I think most cultivators would agree that cultivators in the state right now are sitting on, um, sorry, uh, cultivators right now are sitting on literally metric tons of processed cannabis in Vermont. So there are literally thousands and thousands of pounds sitting that aren't moving right now. So I think that considering capping, in my opinion, all licenses uh, for the time being, I think would be a great move. Uh, and then the other comment I wanted to make uh, is about the fact that um, somebody else, I think with a family tree brought up a point that you know, small cultivators need you know every advantage we can get, you know, especially going uh, to be honest, even tier threes. Um, but the fact that we can't have keef uh, or dry sift or whatever you want to call it as cultivators is kind of crazy to me because it's actually a byproduct of trimming. Um, so when we trim, uh, most companies use trim bins uh, or some type of trim bin that has a screen on the bottom and it collects the keef so you're not wasting product. Uh, so we, you know, we're a small company. We're a mixed tier two, uh, much like Family Tree. We only got to tier two so we could grow more outdoor plants. Uh, our indoor is only 480 square feet. We're finishing up a second room, which will be another 150 square foot. So we're under 1,000 square feet. Um, but we are currently sitting on Keef that we can't sell and we can't do anything with and we're just expected to i guess throw it away um and to me that just is a little crazy because you know like jane was saying like we need every every uh um advantage we can get in this market and being able to advertise infused pre-rolls 
would give us the opportunity to, you know, charge twice the amount that we're charging for a normal flower free roll. And um, as I said, it, it's it's a byproduct. So I had a dispensary owner at our farm recently, and and she saw a bunch of Keith and said, I would love to buy that from you. And I said, well, I would love to sell it to you, but I can't. Um, so I just yeah, wanted to bring it up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would, you know, I'm not going to give any sort of legal advice on the fly here, but I would just look at Act 65 from last year, 2023, because we changed, the legislature changed some of the allowances of what cultivators could do. And it's not about making infused pre-rolls, but it is about, you know, certain products that they're allowed to possess and sell. So you just want to probably look at that, those changes that were made, um, and it might give you some guidance on this issue. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, well, that's it. Those are the only two points I wanted to bring up. And thank you guys for all your hard work. And uh, I will add just another thing about. Our compliance officer, yeah, our compliance officer is is very busy. So I would just agree with what he said that maybe trying to get her some help or approve overtime would be awesome. And that's it. Thank you guys. Great, thank you. Okay, we have Chris Vickers. Hey, this is Chris Vickers, Rootland Cannabis, uh, Hickory Hash and Bud. I'm a mixed tier one, um, and I'm also a tier one manufacturer. And uh, yeah, it's been going pretty good. Um, I totally agree with what a bunch of people are saying that the market has kind it of has consideration of market. And uh, and uh, you know I I got a I got a manufacturing license because I needed to be able to process my trim into hash and uh, that's just part of what we all do as cultivators and it really needs to be added as part of a cultivation license it can be a mixed plus or a tier one plus or something like that but um, yeah we we all need to have the ability to to do what we do with our product instead of having to have, you know, a mixed license and a manufacturing license and uh, and all this renewals that are re really aren't even renewals. They're more like reapplications. The, the process is no easier to do it a second time. And, uh, you know, at that at that point, I think that having a license that's good for two years or three years would be a real advantage. It would free up a lot of your staff there. It would make things a lot easier for us having to redo this over and over. I mean, we didn't get into this to do it one year. We're going, we're in it, you know. So having to do it every single year is a, is a real pain for us. Um, I just want to, um, you know, just state that you know that's a cottage industry thing, and and as a cottage industry business, we you know we like doing all of it. We like indoor. We like outdoor. We like making our hash. We want to make infused products. Uh, maybe some edibles, um, you know, we kind of want to do it all. So, I, you know, maybe coming up with some kind of cottage industry uh, grouping would be the way to go for tier one and tier two. Uh, you know, not bringing in uh, material from other people, just working with our own material. Thank gotcha. you for your time. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Chris. <laughs> okay, we have someone who's joined as guest. You want to unmute yourself? Okay. Just a that up, but um, only comment I have at this point would be that I wish I could do something I was responsible for looking at it, but um, flavored papers. Flavored are not for kids. <laughs> I mean, it's, I, I don't know, it's no different than adding salt and pepper to your food. People like flavors, so outside of the cannabis having its own distinct flavor, especially if you got a good grower, you know, it would be nice to open that door up for the creative minds and uh, let them have some fun with it while they're trying to make a living. Um, and people will like it. I, I can assure you of that. So I really wish you guys would, would do something to help get the okay or the approval through to say, yeah, you can make, you can use flavored papers. I'm talking about like, whether it be Stigarello type papers or whether it be joint papers flavored, you know, it's 
good bud tastes great, but boy, you can do a lot with it. So I'll leave it at that. All right, thank you. Anyone else for a public comment? All right, I will close the public comment window. Thank you for all the comments. You know, this is legislature meets for a very short amount of time each year. And I think a lot of what you're hearing, a lot of those repeat comments and themes are things that we really don't have a lot of control over. Um, but uh, there are certain things that we do. And so we always appreciate the comments and the advice and the kind of you know, boots on the ground kind of vantage point that she provides. So keep the comments coming. Thank you. Um, certainly reach out to your legislature, uh, your legislators, both House and Senate, um, and um, let them know how you feel. Um, so with that, I will uh, adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Thanks.